Whether you keep them in your home or love to see them in theirs, these are the creatures that bring us all together. Reptiles. Reptiles. We're going to be delving into the experiences of reptile lovers from around the block and around the world. This is the Reptile Talk Podcast. What's oh, going sorry, on? Here, sorry, sorry, sorry. It's Jeremy Turchin from Brassman Reptiles. And I'm Rob, and I'm creeping it real. <laughs> what? what is so funny, man? I don't understand. All I'm I'm just going to suggest to our audio only listeners that uh, they just go to YouTube for the first <laughs> fifteen or twenty seconds of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll understand why <laughs> I can't finish a complete sentence. <laughs> why you're laughing at all the intros. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. It's what, What's up, Jeremy? How you doing? <laughs> I'm great, man. I'm, I'm, I'm fucking amazing. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. I'm in the middle of of juggling some enclosures um, because I got some black box cages coming here very shortly. And so I thought I could get all of my cage and furniture juggling all done before we started today, but I didn't. So I have cages strewn about and scrubs next to my bathroom and like all over the freaking place. So (laughs) I'm okay. I'm okay. How are you doing? just moving around a reptile room bro that's yes yeah that's, yeah that's exactly what it comes to. Yeah. <laughs> uh no, doing? i'm doing i'm doing good man today was a, a chill low-key day i uh am finally i finally found a, a medicine regimen with my allergy meds that uh, allows me to rest at night and breathe throughout the day so i'm freaking hey. thankful for that because holy christ um just been beating my ass man like you have no freaking idea um but outside of that no complaints um amazons have been locking up which is super exciting um had a couple ball pythons do some prelay shed stuff uh and colubra just started to pair up which is fun hey, so, should... had some some corn, some Mexican black kings, um, maybe North Mexican pine snakes, maybe. It's a uh, Jedi action. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> and uh, I think I've now pulled the tenth clutch of leopard gecko eggs for the season uh, for these projects with with Mark. So that's that's pretty fun. And uh, yeah, so I can't complain, dude. That's tight. That's tight. I'm dude, super and before. Excited. Yeah, before we get too deep into it, wanted to say that tonight's episode is brought to you by Black Box Cages. That's uh, right. Our sponsor, and they're also a sponsor for the other network that we're, we're having a, a, a crossover episode with tonight. That's uh, it. We got tonight, we have a very special guest, someone who's very near and dear to my heart. <laughs> we, have, we have Mr. Phil Wolf from the Nephris Initiative and from the uh, her petticulture podcast and her petticulture network our snakes and stokies let's get him on here what up dude salutations <laughs> <laughs> the sounds of smooth jazz and the soft voice of phil wolf the, the and rat man. The, 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 I'm, I'm sick and i'm batman um, <laughs> yeah, the, 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 c- cigarettes and, and geckos right hell yeah <laughs> oh man what's up boys <laughs> Dude, it's much, it's man. been going pretty good today i caught a five line skink and a dk snake at work so hey i can't hey, complain dude who's better dude, than you dude i, I her living it job. Up. i love it legit getting paid baby <laughs> paid to herp it's good it's good you know i tell Hell the customers yeah. i'm like i'm doing a very thorough inspection right now i'm going above and beyond oh look a yeah. snake <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's good Oh awesome. gosh! Just start recommending to your customers that they throw like plywood or tin down in their yard. Actually, like, I actually had know. to tell someone not to do that because they had a giant piece of tin in the, like right next to their house, and they have like a one year old. And when I went in to do their service, the wife was wearing one of the green eco wear hats. This this one actually with the copper head on the top, and I was like, oh damn! I had that exact hat. That's so cool. I saw the tin on the side of your house. So like, how how into snakes are you guys? And they're like, oh, we don't. 
we don't like snakes. I just bought this hat at like a museum because I didn't, it was really sunny that day. So I bought this hat and I was like, Oh, well, you might want to get rid of that tin on the uh, side of your house because it's going to produce some snakes. And when I came back like six months later, giant, th- like two and a half, three foot copperhead underneath it. I was like, you guys should really get rid of that tin, man. Nice. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. What can uh, I say? Like, the biggest letdown ever. Like, what are the fine for me, man? No, no, no. I'm yes for you. But I'm I'm speaking like as far as like the conversation with that customer. Oh yeah, what, yeah. What are the odds of you wearing an eco wear hat and not being into reptiles? Like, yeah, that's, what that's crazy. <laughs> oh, especially the copperhead one. Yeah, Jeez. right. <laughs> so, Phil, oh, for the people God. who listen to us who might not know your background, what's like an abridged version of of where what brought you up to where you're at right now? Or you can give us the full version. Uh, um, uh, Berms, who you are and what you're doing. No, yeah, yeah, but, Just, no. This giant swamp pythons. No, um, no. <laughs> I uh, I've been doing this a long time. Uh, I kind of dove head first about 20 years ago, doing working for some importer, exporter, wholesaler type stuff, and. I just, I've been fell in love, man. Just like you guys, when we're kids, we start small and we, it just gets bigger and better. And, and you get a grown up and you get a paycheck and you're like, man, I can, I can have the world, right? Why not learn as much as I can? And a <laughs> few, few years ago, I linked up with Justin Smith uh, from the Herbert Culture Network, as it's called now. And we started a show called Snakes and Stogies. And then that kind of, that just blossomed. And then working with the th and thp boys and girls and uh and then later on my good friend nipper reed in, in london uh, we got together and started venom exchange radio uh which is basically an all venomous podcast and uh yes. here i am <laughs> that's, I, that's the abridged yeah. version right yes yes <laughs> indeed. at I, some point I meeting podcast. you two oh thank you thank you very much at some point <laughs> along the way running into both of you and uh the rest is history as they say Hell yeah, hey. <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> today's episode has been brought to you by random dancing so- yes <laughs> random head undulations <laughs> i'll take random neck movements for 500 rob for 500 <laughs> 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 this is why we're friends, right? This is, this is, this is, this is it. Forget the snakes. Forget the oh lizards. This is it. Oh, it's man. the neck undulations. The yeah. neck undulations. <laughs> they bring people together. It does. It does. Fun for the whole family. Oh, my <laughs> Lord. <laughs> So, Phil, I, I did want to touch on a few different things uh, on our podcast tonight, but yeah. uh, Jeremy and I worked at New England Reptile for a while. I'm of sure the people who are listening know know that. And so we saw like a lot of crazy, unusual stuff come through there and, and got experience with a lot of different uh, species in working there. Um, w- what was that like for you working at like an import export facility and getting your getting your legs, so to speak, with a lot of the stuff they got going on there? Well, I I realized that it it takes a lot to do that, like to 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 have a facility like that. You need different people that have different specialties, and then a lot of people they learn as they go. And I was one of those people that I knew enough to get in trouble, but I really had that thirst for knowledge to just learn as much as I can. And there's no better way to diversify the herpetological knowledge base than to work or or interact with a facility much as nerd or strictly or underground or blackwater or any of these big companies. Um and it was it was a wild ride, a lot of a lot of fun, a lot of jokes, a lot of hard work. Um seeing specimens that you'd never thought you'd ever see. Uh seeing people come in to a horse trough with a thousand baby ball pythons and just having this one guy you never seen him before this little old guy and he's just picking up every single baby ball looking for this one individual scale and then he comes back two years later he's like hey remember that little ball python i got with little zigzag on the side guess what that turned into and it's the next morph so (laughs) aside from seeing things like that develop and evolve uh it was super cool to interact with as many species as i did 
so in Florida, for having venomous reptiles, uh, it used to be a lot more lax. Now it's very, very strict in terms of the amount of hours you need, in terms of the amount of experience that you have to gain for the different types of venomous as the state classifies them. But back then, it was kind of just get your hours. You needed a thousand hours at the time. You had to do it for a year. So I got to work with the coolest species on the planet. Just and and yes, they weren't mine, but I got to interact with them and work with them and learn from experts and and gain that knowledge base that only makes you a better keeper, only makes you a better herper. And it, I wouldn't I wouldn't have changed it for anything, man. It was awesome. Dude, hell yeah. I don't know if that answered um, your question or not, but sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it definitely did. It, like getting getting to experience so many different species, like a lot of people don't understand. Or it's hard for them to conceptualize the idea that, you know, if you work with somebody who breeds ball pythons, you'll get really good at like palpating ball pythons and, you know, changing your water dishes, using your protocol, doing this, that, and the other thing. But when you are working with 50 species every single day and there's like oh, 10 different species. kinds of parameters, yeah. yeah um, you know, you, you learn a lot and it pushes you to figure things out in a way that, you know, working with one species or two species just will never do. Yeah. And, and the, the ability to interact with animals that normal people wouldn't necessarily get the ability to like, you guys have worked with divergence. Like mm -hmm. I've yeah. never seen one in person. So mm -hmm. that to me, like, that's super cool. I'm not even a big boy guy, but just the, the fact that you guys yeah. got to interact with them and, and learn from Kevin and, and kind of, learn what's been learned already and then do some trial and error kind of learn as you go yeah. with that with that genera uh is yeah. super fascinating you know and i'm, I'm envious of both of you just for that one species let alone the countless <laughs> others you guys got to work with yeah bro it, it it's it's hard for people to to like conceptualize like like i said it's just hard for people to conceptualize how many different species a place like that takes in and works with each year and yeah. you know there's only so many hours in the day there's so many there's only so many things you can <laughs> you know learn about and uh when you're dealing with imports and, and establishing things and doing stuff like that it definitely gives you this ability to learn a whole lot yeah. in a rel relatively short period of time you know it's yeah, awesome absolutely. Absolutely. I do miss those divergence too. They're such a freaking cool snake. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A buddy of mine down by me, he's got them and he's working on breeding them, but I just, I haven't had time to go see them, but hopefully yeah. he gets to produce some cause we, we need more of them in the country. We definitely do. You should 100%. do it. You should check them out. Yeah. yeah. You, you Honestly, definitely should take that trip, man. It'd be so oh, freaking worth it. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of them are prettier when they're babies or when they're younger. Um, mm -hmm. And then they, you know, they are not quite as, eye like to me, they're just not as eye grabbing as when they're older. Like the Lata Fasciata, bro. Yeah. Those things are phenomenal. No, yeah, those yeah. things like really are striking when you, when you get to like see them up close. Yeah. And a, a good friend of ours, Jeff Frederick, who, who might be listening, might not, he has, he urges me to always throw in some common names too so we're talking about the philippines cat-eyed snake for those listening oh yeah like the luzon luzon blue yes. cat-eyed snake blue, or whatever yeah. and yeah yeah i don't know right. what the other uh, last i feel, I feel I jeff over my shoulder yelling at me so <laughs> yeah. english yeah. english it'd be, yeah. it'd be my mom she's always telling me that she's like dumb it down make it like <laughs> dumb it down yeah <laughs> that's why i like listening to to like uh to snakes and stogies and like the hermetic culture network and and the venice exchange radio is because you guys go deeper into using latin names and things like that and i feel like it's just that little bit deeper that if you if you've got a good base knowledge it's really really like i don't know it's more connective for me when, when i'm well, listening to it as opposed to just listening to stuff that just uses the common names <laughs> hey it's it's cool man until you get the one thing that's like green rat snake <laughs> which one? Green which bush one? Snake. <laughs> yeah. yeah which one right but i appreciate oh, that God. sincerely i do yeah they're like oh a vine snake and i'm like you mean like a tula tula or prasina so you're talking about oxybaris like what are you what are we getting at here yeah oh yeah I, there was just uh one of the one of the south african guys did a poll on instagram and it was like 
what common name should you use for this? And it was it was Teletornis, which we always call them twig snakes. But I guess mm-hmm. there's certain parts of South Africa they call them vine snakes. But they have yep. another snake that's vi- that they call oh. vine snakes. So it's like mm-hmm. which, which one's gonna melt you from the inside? Which one's just gonna look <laughs> nasty? Yeah. <laughs> and these are the real questions. Right. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. man. Were there any species that you got in back then that you were like, oh, man, I really need this, uh, but you just like were not able to get, keep your hands on them? Yeah, there was there was a lot of species. So the majority of the time when I worked the import export stuff, it was venomous. And uh, yeah. and there were several species that I didn't. I didn't buy for myself because I was like, oh, they'll come in. They'll come in again next year. You know, I'll, I'll get the next shipment. Um, and some of them, some of them I, I did take home and some of them I just kept there as pets. Some of them I bought them. I kept them there as pets just so I could maintain them every day when I'm at work. Um, and I was like, you know what? It's been six months. Let's let's get them to a new home. Let someone else experience them. So like uh, Atheris hispida, the hairy bush viper, mm-hmm. I kept I kept one alive that looked like a death's door. I kept it alive for like six months and uh, I realized that I was spending a lot of money in in green tree frogs to feed this thing. So I said, you know what? Let me get rid of it. And I regret that species. I should have kept that and I should have documented everything. I should have taken photos and video and just for almost like a citizen science kind of way, because I'm not that educated, but every little bit of information that we can record as herpetoculturists could benefit these animals in some way or another. So that's one species off the top of my head that I remember. And honestly death adders because we got in so many indonesian locality death adders and Damn. they were cheap man i think i paid my first pair of blue lavis the smooth death adders i paid like mm-hmm. 80 bucks each and, <laughs> you know so oh. and, and you kept them for a few months and then all of a sudden a batch of red ones would come in and go you know what let me sell the blue ones i'll keep the red ones for a little bit and six months <laughs> later you get rid of those and now they're just unobtainium so things like that definitely uh uh damn you have, you have no regrets no regrets it hurts. But, yeah. <laughs> bro we were i yeah. i was at uh willie beard's place venom central this past weekend yeah well, in great south pictures, carolina man. and dude i i wish i had taken more i was like mingling and talking with people and 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 i wish i had gotten like better shots of the enclosures because these enclosures were phenomenal and they like the gaboon exhibit i think it was like eight foot by 10 foot by five foot tall it was massive yeah. and it had windows on both sides so you could like go around it and see both sides that's awesome. it was so freaking and like the lechesis the uh, melanus ethyl bro yeah. same thing huge giant enclosures i wish i had taken more pictures that really like showed that off because it's like it was phenomenal but we were to bring it back to what we were talking about the death adders we were talking about that and i was like bro i remember when levis used to come in all the freaking time and then i was talking to some people who were dealing with imports and exports and they were like oh yeah one of the guys who was like their the, one of their exporters out there who like regularly collects things like that he got killed by one and so now all the guys are like afraid of that so they don't want to collect them anymore wow that's wild man and see i i heard it, it i heard a very different story of the islands where they're found are so remote that it's not monetarily beneficial advantageous for them to go out there for them to go all the way out there and then when they do they get way more money from europe than they do from us so it's kind of like who's going to pay more and then the stuff just dries up so to speak so that i believe that story too i'm sure there's multiple avenues you know yeah sheesh (sighs) sheesh i man i love death adder something serious and (laughs) i have not been able to get any or keep like keep them or work with them so eventually yeah. that's on that's on my list they're so cool. yeah man for sure for sure and uh right now i keep uh with the exception of some north american colubra it's almost everything i have is exclusively arid desert and stepland grassland uh animals so mm-hmm. there's very few tropical species that i would consider and they're definitely still on my radar i'll make a tropical exception for them you know? <laughs> <laughs> that's fair that's fair yeah. that's a good one <laughs> but yeah man that uh that facility you went to that guy's top notch man and a, a good close friend of mine he actually has a pair of of Urutus from him and mm. stellar oh, specimens yeah. i saw it i know you saw the phenomenal yeah crazy wow. snakes and he's got so. two different lines he's got two different localities um he's got those like silver and black ones and then he's got ones that are like a tan and black too that i got to check out while i was there and man they are phenomenal they're so cool man 
super cool super cool just like you you wouldn't think that they're bothrops if you just saw like a picture yeah. of them with no no context you know yeah and i can't i would can't fathom seeing one in the wild just like in the leaf litter oh my just, gosh yeah like you know moonlight <laughs> shining through you know <laughs> Uh, how, how we fantasize, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. In reality, it's in a little trash pile behind the local bar. It's like yeah, a little exactly. pile. Of them. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, it's like for for a while, uh, I went. In, uh, my buddy and I, Henry, uh, we imported a, an Indonesian shipment, and we got in a bunch. I got in a bunch of black purple maculatas, the uh, mm. uh, shore pit viper, mm. yeah. and most of them were were real rich, dark black, if not super dark purple with the red eyes and i said red them eyes yeah, yeah. Well. and uh almost every single picture on iNaturalist is that specimen from that locality with like a natty ice can in the background <laughs> you know or like or like a styrofoam cup next to the snake and it's like well this is where they live this is their ecosystem that's, so that's... we we basically determined that they are the cotton mouths of the melee peninsula Bro, because that's hilarious. It, it, there's only two snakes that will live in in or around an empty natty ice can and that's purple <laughs> maculatus <laughs> and cotton mouth. <laughs> that is so painfully accurate it hurts <laughs> oh my gosh that's great oh thank you oh my that god <laughs> Oh, that's fucking great, man! Shit. Oh, man. oh. Okay, so you said that, you said that you work with the the hispita before. That's like a lot of people's uh, holy grail, the atheris. Even though I don't think they're as cool as some of the other species, but they are uh, they're they're unique. But they don't get very big, right? They're like a, one of those ones that gets like eighteen inches, if if that. Yeah, the biggest one we ever brought in was probably about. 18 to 20 inches and, and yeah. they're, they're, they're very lean. They're only about as thick as your pinky. Um, and I, I know there's a lot of people that have been seeing them in the wild lately on eco tours, which is fantastic. Sadly to say that there's also a lot of rumor of them being staged because they are becoming uh. scarcer and scarcer. Um, they're a very, very cool species. I feel like they're one of the more intelligent of the bush viper family of that atheris or mm. atheris bush viper family. Uh, but they're almost exclusively amphibian and snail eaters. Yeah. So it's very difficult to turn them onto rodents. I never even tried because I knew it was just going to be a stretch. Yeah. Um, I feel like if more people had the ability to keep them nowadays, the, the mindset, the mantra is very different than it was 15, 20 years ago. 15, 20 years ago, it was let's keep it alive. Now it's let's eliminate the stress factor. Let's give it more of what its ecosystem actually is. And mm -hmm. our mindset has evolved to that point where I feel like if people got them now, they would do a better job than we did 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Especially with the amount of frogs that are being captive bred right now, I bet you, you could get like 500 frozen, thaw, you know, frozen white's tree frog tadpoles for relatively cheap or, you know, uh, uh, Pac-Man pixie frog tadpoles too. You, you know, if you really wanted to, you could get those sort of things and supplement your feeding or use it for scenting or whatever, you know? Yeah. The, um, it's funny you mentioned that, uh, you know, people are very, apprehensive to use pet animals as feeders and mm -hmm. we've talked about on some of the other shows you know crested geckos are so prolific that mm -hmm. i'm sure at some point we may get to an area where we can have hatchling cresteds as feeders whether they be frozen or live or what have you and i know that's a taboo thing to say but having the mindset of these animals could be commercialized in a, I don't want to say farming role. And that's not to take away from crested geckos. I love geckos. I'm a gecko fanatic. Um, or even like binos geckos. For the longest time, I was trying to find binos geckos to feed to knobtails. Because mm -hmm. I know that in the wild, that's what they eat. The adult yeah. and the eye in the central red center of Alice Springs, Uluru, all that jazz. They're eating wild bino geckos in the wild because mm -hmm. they're big enough to do it. So I feel like there is a way to jump into that more naturalistic feeding for some of these harder to keep or more, I don't want to say exotic or more eclectic species. Uh, I used to keep uh, Cossus, the genus Cossus, which is uh, the snouted night adders, small terrestrial mm. vipers from uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And I almost exclusively fed them green tree frogs. And I know this is going to sound taboo, but we wound up getting 
Florida green tree frogs, and we would uh, basically euthanize them like we euthanize rats, and then we would freeze them inside of a, a plastic wrap, and that way you can almost roll it out uh, like wax paper, and then just pop mm. off a frozen frog, thaw it out, and then go from there. And I feel yeah. like it, had I not done that, I, there's no way I could have kept that that genera in captivity. It just it just wouldn't have worked. Right. Yeah. So I feel like we're at a point now in herpetoculture where the mindset has evolved to be more naturalistic and give the animal more of a stress-free environment, more replicant to what they're living in the wild, and hopefully be able to provide them the the prey items that they actually desire or would instinctually need opposed to just forcing a rat down his throat yeah i I think also it goes goes past just what they would instinctually want but also like the health benefits oh eating what they should be eating versus what we force them to eat um you know like i had a really lengthy conversation uh tinley with ron st pierre and i know he just did a podcast with uh with mj and he was talking about his regurgitation issue and his thought process on the rats that they primarily eat being fruit eating rats versus the rats that we feed them here in the states which are more grain fed and how uh the potential of the lower gi tract inflammation that causes them to regurge coming from irritation from the grain that those rodents are being fed <clears throat> you know we're talking about imported animals that would be eating these fruit eating rodents yeah you know so it's like it's it's interesting when when you start to break down some of these more taboo barriers into certain sure. species even something as common as an emerald tree boa um but start thinking about it differently and see what yeah. kind of strides you can make in in appropriate husbandry along the way um so i think it's it's important now that we have stuff like crested geckos that are produced by literally the tens of thousands yeah you know like there is no reason we can't be you know, reaching out to folks like Anthony Caponetto and being like, hey, man, <laughs> yeah, I know you got exactly. 10,000 low end crested geckos like let's make something happen, you know, but to, to satisfy that, like I, I know somebody who used uh, baby crested geckos to get a green tree python to start feeding. Yeah. You know, you yeah. know, so I mean, it, it does work and it is possible, you know, but I agree that's that's the, like the next layer of taboo that exists already within our circle. You know, sure, it's like, you can't sure. feed that. It's cute. I love it. It's it's my gecko friend, and it's like, yeah, yeah. But you know, but, <laughs> yeah, it goes. We, we always talk about Steve Ranella's cute and cuddly theory. You know, uh, mm. you can't you can't hunt bears because they're cute and cuddly. You can't hunt wolves because they're cute and cuddly. But what happens is the environment that we've you know contained for them they're now ruining everything else because no one's managing them because they're not being taken care of one way or another. So it goes, it, like Steve Rinello's cute and Kelly theory. Don't feed my cute crested gecko off because it's cute. Well, how about right. this? Why don't we start with every single frog butt, which by the way, my favorite kind of crested gecko is the frog. <laughs> butt. Uh, why don't we freeze their tail? People throw the yeah. tail away. Yeah, yeah for freeze real. the tail. Now you can you can use that tail. You can make you can blend it and puree it and make it into a liquid additive to put as a scenting tool, or even chop it up into smaller pieces and use that as a scent incentive for certain species. So I don't know. I think we we di- diverted on this conversation slightly. But. <laughs> well, one of the species I think that gets overlooked, or maybe it's just because there isn't as many people producing them now as, as there was at one time, but the uh, the pictus geckos. Uh, yeah. They reproduce at such a rapid rate. <clears throat> one of my uh, one of my friends, Rich Sawtell, who's, who's in Florida now, uh, he bred. He's like these things breed like crickets. He's like I literally have to throw away eggs because I'm over. And when they're born, they're like so so small that even baby candoia and, and things like that would be able to eat them. Sure. Um, and, and he was like, these are like the perfect feeder. And he was like, yeah, I've, you know, if somebody was wanting a good solid lizard feeder, you know, the adults are, you know, what, three and a half inches, small, yeah, small yeah. adult leopard mm-hmm. gecko size. And then the babies are microscopic. Well, like, they're so incredibly <laughs> small when they're born, but they do grow rapidly. So it's like one of those things where um, if you are dedicated to working with a more unusual species that may have a more, um, particular diet exploring different avenues like that 
could be ways to get these things established. And then as we get them more established, then, you know, generations down the line, maybe they can change up what they're being fed. But in the meantime, getting them established and making sure that there is a captive breeding population of them, you got to do what you got to do to make sure that those animals are doing well. It's not about one of the things that I think about all the time is it's not about what I want for the animal. It's what the animal wants because so many people are like, well, I want to put this thing in a 10 foot by six foot enclosure. And I'm like, okay, but does your snake want to be in a 10 foot by six foot enclosure? Like, (laughs) is that going to stress it out? They're like, it's a Calabar burrowing python. Of course it wants to be in a 10 by six. And I'm like, oh man. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, oh, Uh, your arboreal Calabar burrowing python. Okay. I I, I understand. It it was in a tree once. It's therefore the whole species. My father hung me on a hook once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but going back to Ron St. Pierre, man, I mean, talk about a guy who's dialed in. You know, his Emerald program is oh just my gosh. incredible. And I had no idea about the the rodents eating the fruits, but I remember there was a, a I don't know if it was a study or just like a show or something, but there was some mammal in a some smaller arboreal mammal that was in a rainforest and they were chopping down a particular type of tree for lumber, what have you. Mm-hmm. And they were noticing that the mammals were disappearing, <clears throat> excuse me, and they started to catch them and weigh them and take blood. And they're basically figuring out that they're surviving on the food that's there, but they're not getting the sugars that they would normally get from the particular nuts of those trees. So talking about like the rodents that eat fruit opposed to rodents that are eating a, a fairly grain based diet, the emeralds may need some kind of sugar or, or some kind of, uh, uh, glucose level that we're not even on on that same wavelength right. and i think think about those arboreal mammals you know bush babies or whatever the hell they were um mammals are not my forte uh <laughs> but just on a on a caloric and, and nutrition level how are how is that affecting what we're doing you know and we talk about right people that feed king cobras rodents and look i know it works i know guys that do it they they trick them into eating it or they can they acclimate them to eat rodents but most of them don't live a full life because it's just too much protein it's too much fat it's too much fur whatever it may be and and they usually die young so i know i'm preaching the choir with you guys you guys being people (laughs) that have kept kings before but i I really like what you went with the 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 fruit that's that's super fascinating i gotta hit up ron about that that's cool yeah it was it, it when uh yeah, when we spoke at Tinley, he brought it up and I said to him, I was like, I'm like, man, you know, there's there's very few people that really like push me to think about the first of all, captive husbandry, like t- taking that to the next level of certain species, but also like really thinking about where the animals come from yeah. and, and the the full uh, like pyramid breakdown, like what that looks like. Um, yeah. And I was like, you have consistently been that guy. <laughs> you yeah, know man. but it's it's really interesting to to think about and i mean i think about the you know you mentioned king cobras you think about even stuff like the asian vine snakes yeah mm-hmm. you know so I, I feel like there's there's a lot of species that uh for the most part kind of fly under the radar you know because maybe you can get them to, to take rodents or whatever but uh you know they would thrive or live a, a more full life if we fed primarily that more naturalistic diet. So yeah, I yeah. think that plays a huge role in in keeping and producing them successfully in captivity. But also, like, I think that's one of the next layers that's going to uh, push captive herpetoculture forward in the in the u.s you know is like finally sure. breaking down some of these barriers and being like okay yes i love my crested gecko but you know what i'm gonna have a trio of these myself to produce my own feeders you know yeah. especially when, when we're talking about an animal that you know as far as expense goes is very minimal yeah, you know, yeah. you're talking about, you know, I'm just going to go get some Crest Gecko diet and I'm good. You know, exactly. it costs me 15 bucks every three months, you yeah. know, and I'm pretty freaking good. Like, there's no reason why we can't start kind of breaking down those barriers to be able to make a lot larger strides towards keeping some of these more niche species um, longer in captivity yeah. and establishing hopefully healthy captive generations of them in the future. Hell yeah. yeah. I'm with it a thousand percent. 
we we literally had a uh, a woman at at Nerd. Well, she's a customer that came into the the pet store all the time, and she had an Atula Prasina vine snake. She had it for over. I think she said the last time I spoke to her, she was like, "Yeah, it's like she's had it for twelve years now." Wow! And she wow. would come in and she'd get you know anoles to feed it to every other week or so, and then she would supplement with feeder fish. And she's just like, it's the same cost as getting like a large rat. You know, it's, yeah. it's right around the same price as getting a large rat. If I was feeding it to, you know, a python or a boa and people think, of, oh, well, I got to feed a lizard. It's going to be so expensive. And it's like, how much are you really spending on a large extra large rat for your, you know, adult python compared to what a feeder or a knoll is going to be? And it's right yeah. around the same price. And so she yeah, actually had it now. for 12 years, bro. Yeah, crazy. that's, that's crazy. wild. Wild. I love it. Yeah. And she had like a fully planted um, uh, paludarium. So she had like a water feature in the bottom and vines and all the crazy. You know, it's crazy. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, I think that's the, that really is the next, the next level, you know, but it's, it's cool to see uh, the, the random pet keeper that does just that little extra bit of research, you know, to figure out, okay, well, what does this animal really need to eat? Number one, and then number two, to sit there and do a financial breakdown to make yeah. that make sense. Like most of them are like, no, nah, I'm not going to, no, no, man, it's feeder yeah. lizards. Are, you know, lizards are too expensive. It's going to be terrible. But, you know, the reality is when you go to a, a retail pet shop and a small rat is six ninety nine, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, well, that that four ninety nine and old doesn't seem that bad. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, just pick out the fattest, chunkiest one you got in there. There you go, <laughs> it's man. Like... There you go. <laughs> it's what it is. So, hey. Hey, you know, just, just grab grab a friend, drive down to Florida, just get a butterfly net, and drive real close to the edge of the all road. the brown and olds, baby. There you, there you go, dude. <laughs> all the ones you can catch, as many as you can fit in a bag. Yeah, if it's if it's not lime green, fair game. Yeah. Take it. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Oh man. Dude. So you have got a phenomenal venomous collection, and you are working with <laughs> with the uh, with, with the venomous exchange radio. And and I have a, a passion for venomous snakes as well. So I do love listening to the venomous exchange. Radio. Thank you. If, Thank you very much. If you're within earshot and you're listening to this right now, you should go listen to it because it's got some really incredible information and good conversations. If you're curious Thank about. You venomous snakes um and you have a a deep-seated love for all things african when it comes to venomous snakes so i we can't go the episode without talking about some african venomous snakes yeah let's rock and roll i'm all about it man the the dark continent calls to me i don't know what it is man the history the people just it, it everything about it i just i love everything about it man it, the culture itself and the evolution of the culture and the animals within that culture everything from the the python worshipers in the west coast to you know the uh, germans in east africa reclassifying animals because they've realized that this one doesn't look like this one and it's all it's absolutely fascinating and I do love desert stuff. And so the, the MENA region, as we call it, you know, Middle East, North Africa, I've been trying to get as many of those species as I can, just because it's, it's fairly simple in their husbandry, very Euromastics, if you will. Um, <laughs> so I got a nice little uh, eclectic group of stuff and who knows what the future holds. So, but yeah, I'm, I'm all about the African snakes, man, especially the venomous. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. I mean, there's, there's so much draw when it comes to the, African species, you know, if you ask a random reptile person what their favorite venomous snake is, I would say that probably like 80% of people are going to say gaboons. Just like based on the amount of people that I've talked to, gaboon vipers just hold people's attention for some reason more than everything else. And I personally don't understand it, but I, (laughs) I, I hear that it's a thing, you know. There's so coming, many cool coming from the guy species. who likes blood pythons. You're like, yeah, I don't I'm, know why people don't like the fat sausage thing or do yeah, like the fat yeah. sausage. It's, thing. it's it's one thing to be a fat sausage, but why have a fat sausage that is brown when you can have a fat sausage that's neon green, red, and blue? Like, come on, what is the what is this? What is yeah. this? I don't understand. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you, man. That's yeah, the, the 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 bitus or bitus genus is a a fantastic gateway drug to venomous man because most of them (laughs) don't get more than 20 inches long 
So as, as long as you can afford the price tag, they're fairly easy to keep in captivity. They make great venomous snakes to yeah. keep in captivity. I can't afford some of the more more unique ones, but I yeah. keep puffs, I keep gaboons, and uh, I, I hope to breed Cape Puffs this year, so that'll be happy. Ooh. And uh, if, yeah. if it sticks... And uh, I like the Cape Puff locality because the more southwest you go, they're typically a smaller snake. Uh, puff adders, I'm pretty sure, uh, talking to Stephen Spalls, said that it's the most fecundity of any land vertebrate. I think the record's like 163 babies in one litter, something like that. <laughs> oh, um, my God. Yeah, I know. He he had said that he had a female Tanzanian puff that had dropped 150 offspring one time. Wow. Um, it's actually on the the back of his the cover of his book sun sand and snakes um so but the cape puffs the ones in the southwest corner by cape town uh they only have usually less than 20 so hoping for that far more reasonable <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh my gosh Dude, yeah. that's wild. I mean, I remember that uh, talking to Timmy and Kevin uh, up at Nerd, they said that they had bred their puffs once, you know, a, a long time ago, and their female dropped, like, I think they said 40 or 50 babies uh, at yeah. the time, and that's that's like a fairly average number for, for you know, a, a good-sized adult female. It's yeah. Wild. Yeah. I do think it's crazy how as many people love Gaboon Vipers, they don't really know that there's two different species. There's an East Coast and a West oh, Coast. My goodness. <laughs> it's frustrating. Oh, sure. Bit, it bit is. rhinoceros, bit of scabotica. But, yeah. One's uh, got horns, one doesn't. So. I, uh, I was recently at the uh, Louisville Zoo in Kentucky, and they had a huge East African gaboon on display. And I was like, oh, cool, a gaboon. And then I looked at the eye stripes, and I was like, oh. A gaboon, like oh, this is much more interesting now. <laughs> yeah, man, for sure, for sure. Oh, man. It's, yeah. P- I, if, it, and people are just they just don't know. They're just like, yeah. oh, it's a gaboon viper. It's yeah. a gaboon viper. It's a gaboon viper. It's a gaboon viper. And I'm like, oh, maybe not. Maybe not though. Maybe, yeah. right. <laughs> Have you ever tried? No. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I sure remember going to uh, Hamburg Expo in Pennsylvania. And seeing like a sweater box, and it was filled all the way. And, you know, it's a sweater box. It's what eight inches deep, and it was filled almost top to bottom, and the whole way around with the gaboon viper. And its head was like almost as big as my hand, and I don't have small hands. And I was like, "How the hell did you get this in the box? I don't understand. This thing is like it fills up the entire box. How did you get it in there?" Very carefully, Rob. Very carefully. Very, yeah, very, very carefully. And they're yeah. lucky that gaboons are, on average, pretty docile and amenable to being handled. You know. Yes. Yeah. Yes. They're they're tolerant <laughs> until they're not. Exactly. Right. And yeah. when they're not, oh my goodness. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 Oh, I think man. that one of the things that you know when people are like, "Oh man, I would love to get a gaboon viper." I wish that they could see an adult gaboon viper before they buy it because then you see a little gaboon viper at a show you're like oh this is pretty cool or you see like even like a two and a half foot gaboon viper you're like oh you know that's a good size viper they don't see the ones that are like as big as a loaf of bread and like you know four foot long they don't see those yeah and they can become quite the hefty snake uh and i feel like a lot of people are not prepared for a you know loaf of bread 10 pound 12 pound highly toxic you know giant head giant venom glands big fangs like it's not a beginner species of venomous snake you know no no not at all (laughs) and and in the past the west africans were brought in by the bushel and they were so cheap i think wholesale was like 75 bucks 75 bucks yep was like 125 and and a lot of people that got into venomous or they were getting their hours or they were getting their tutelage through mentorship. And one of the first species they get is they, they get a baby gaboon because it's cute and it's easy to feed. They're very hardy animals. They're very forgiving animals in terms of husbandry. And then they realize after one, two, three years of taking care of this neonate that it's kind of a boring species. And although yeah. they are yeah. very aesthetically pleasing, it, 
I admit I have one just to have one. There's no, yeah. it doesn't really interact well. It doesn't want to be messed with. It kind of just sits there. So it's a very uh, unexciting animal after long term, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. But they are, they I are think, super cool. Yeah. And, and, but I, I wish that also people who are getting into Venomous, uh, that's why I think it's important that people have a mentor uh, so that they can get some experience and get some. Um, what's the word, not hindsight, but like some insight into things like that. And then also feeding, because until you've seen a Gaboon Viper strike at a prey so item, oh I don't God. think you can comprehend how quickly they, these, you know, they look very unassuming. And when they're moving about, they move pretty slow most of the time. <laughs> when there is food involved, they are like grease lightning. They're so fast. You don't even see it move. I remember the first time that I saw one strike in person, I was like, I didn't even see that the strike was coming. It was there. And then it was on the rat. Oh, Damn. Gosh. That's a good size fang. Yeah, I was, I wasn't ignoring you. I was trying to find the photo, but I've actually got a, a bigger fang. It's a solid two inches long, but yeah, dude, no. Yeah. Sheesh. Oh man, I, I remember pulling a, a fang out of uh, one of the enclosures at at Nerd, and I was like, "Is that a fang in there?" And so when we were taking them out to do our cleaning, I like went in immediately and I grabbed. It. I was like, "This is a this is a fang," and I put it next to one of the rattlesnake fangs from like a good size. I think it was from the Melosis or from the um, the Western Diamondback that Timmy had in his room, and just the size and girth. Just, just the nuts. girth alone compared from a gaboon to a rattlesnake, even a good size rattlesnake is astounding. It's a little scary, honestly. Yeah. And uh, my, my big breeder female, she's probably right at five foot and mm -hmm. she's at least the thickness of say a cantaloupe, if that yeah. makes sense. And I only feed her a small rat once a week, just because she just doesn't need that much food you know she's so fat reserved and they retain their feces for a number of reasons and you know they like poop every so many weeks so many months and i don't want to overload her but when i give her a small rat on tongs her bite radius is so large that the fangs pass the rat yeah. and they actually hook under her lower lip and she basically puts the whole rat in her mouth and then swallows it there's no like working the rat down. It's just bam, there it is. And then in yep. two gulps, it's gone. So it's wild, yep. man. Good Lord. Yeah. yeah. I just remember taking one of the fangs and like holding it up to my hand and be like, oh, if it bit my hand, the fang yes. would stick out the other side and it would yes. be spraying venoms like out yeah. the other yeah. side. I, of my might, hand. I might survive this, actually. <laughs> there, there's been people that have. There's been people yeah, that have. Really? Oh yeah, they, they got bit in just the right spot on the fleshiness of their hand where the fang went clear through and through. Clear through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they got some residual necrosis at the bite site, but the venom actually injected out of their hand onto the floor. Wild. That's, oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, it's, all, it's already, dude, yeah, I literally, like, <laughs> it's already scary enough to think about being bitten by, by that animal. Yeah. But then to to have it happen and you see what's supposed to enter your bloodstream. <laughs> yeah. Fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, all I can say is fuck it's, that. It's ominous, man, at times yeah. it is. But. but I wish it like Cornuda was more available because oh, that is I such know. like a incredible species. I know. Oh. And that they used to be around like I, at least i remember them being around not super common but like fairly yeah. commonly available back in the day but like not anymore you just yeah you can it. you can get a, a captive bred paraconuta out of europe for about two grand maybe 2100 so and mm. uh there's some rubidia floating around right now mm. um there they go for again 1800 a pair or something like that so there is some of the more dwarf bitters out there they're just they're few and far between because not enough people are, are, are keeping them and not enough people are breeding them and, and that's why they they demand a hefty price tag in that regard so yeah yeah and if you're I listening remember. to this sometime in the crazy future it is currently the beginning of 2024 yeah there you go, there you go. <laughs> i remember when uh i went to um see steve and des 
mm-hmm. and saw the uh, Parviocula. I was <laughs> like, oh, man, those are really cool, man. So, Rob, remember in the beginning of the show when you asked me about regrets? Yes. <laughs> so I was working at a place that got a, air quotes, legit paperwork shipment from Kenya. <laughs> and according to Stephen Smalls, there has only been one sighting confirmed of Parviocula on the north side of the border mountain range in Kenya. Mm-hmm. Everything else is in Ethiopia. Mm-hmm. Regardless, uh, that was a species that I should have bought when I had the chance. And I said, ah, I'll get them on the next shipment. They're everywhere. They breed like uh. weeds. More people will breed them. And no one ever did. And oh, that no. anyone who wants to see a really, really cool uh. African viper, look up Bitis parviocula, the Ethiopian mountain adder. It oh is the goodness. size of a puff adder, but it's neon green and black and gold and awesome. Yeah. Yep. It literally, Ouch. I just remember walking past that enclosure and like stopping dead in my tracks. I was like, yeah. I think that it was just so eye catching to me. I was like, I think that I need that. Yeah. <laughs> like right <Yeah>. now. <laughs> and, and I remember we, we had, we didn't have a lot of them. We probably had, 50 60 of them on that one shipment and they were very placid they were very relaxed and uh, they ate right away they're very opportunistic and we kept them just like we kept gaboons and we had little ones we had big ones and again uh, a phenomenal species that i i wish more people kept and i wish more people bred in captivity because there's there's a lot to learn of those animals yeah man i wish that there was the pre- people bringing them i know it's steven's working on on that but like man i i love those those are so freaking cool yeah yeah, yeah. i didn't really think about it i was like you know all, all these species that i like i'm like oh man and i'm like okay that's from africa okay that's from africa okay that's from africa wait a second that's from africa <laughs> yeah man the best stuff although waggler Subannulatus, tropolamus stuff yes. has a very <laughs> deep place in my heart, and I need some of those in the worst kind of way. <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest, man. I've, I've I've worked with a lot of them over the years. I've never kept them just because I know how hard they are, man. They're they're the they're the emerald tree boa of of venomous. Of venomous, yeah. You know, it, the metabolism is super slow. The environmental demands are extremely tedious. And I feel like if I didn't have a collection, it's one of those species where if I didn't have a collection, I only had maybe two or three of them, and that was it. It was the only animals I had. I could probably do okay with them, but I- I'm not willing to to take them on in any regard because I know I couldn't do it justice. I, I would be yeah. doing a disservice to the animal. So, yeah. 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 But yeah, super cool species. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then we can't go the episode without talking about uh, trans pecos copperheads and other yes. eggs you on because. Yes. Why would you? That I, I have seen some at the Venomous Expo that I've been to, the the Greenville show here in North Carolina, and they have had them both times that I've gone, and I keep looking at it. I'm like, oh man, those things are so freaking cool. I, I just love the Trans Pecos look with the the deep contrast. I just love things yeah. that have contrast, and like Trans Pecos yeah. Copperheads have incredible contrast to them. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Between them and the Osage, like. I'm I'm a Trans Pecos freak. I love West Texas. Uh, I I keep Trans Pecos rat snakes, as you well know, Rob. And uh, I, the I had to have I had to have the copperheads to go with the rat snakes. And I, eventually, when I have more black box enclosures decked out the way I want them, I'm probably going to do a cohab with an adult subak and an adult Trans Pecos rat because I'm 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 one girl heavy on the Trans Pecos. So I might do that cohab and kind of see how it goes because I think that would just be so cool, man. So that would be pretty tight. Yeah. That would be pretty yeah. tight. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. Oh yeah. But yeah, man. The copperheads are great. You know, they're they're super easy species to keep. They're very low maintenance. Uh, they aren't a kistronon, so they like to poop every ten minutes, um, mm-hmm. much like many other colubrids that we keep. But uh, in terms of venomous and like a good starter venomous. I never give, I try not to give starter venomous recommendations, but if you don't have mentorship, if you don't have someone that you can learn from and you're going to dive in head first, 
a copperhead is a great species to keep where you can be completely hands off, only using snake hooks of appropriate length. Mm -hmm. And you can work with the animal and, and, and kind of get a feel for things. And there's still a danger factor there. You're not working with something harmless that's subconsciously in the back of your mind. Ah, if I get bit, what happens? Ah, whatever. No, this will oh. definitively be not good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and you still have that, that danger factor there, but you also get the uniqueness of the species. And because they are desert, arid, grassland, quasi montane, if you will, they're super hardy. So yes. great animals. Love yeah. Them. Then yeah, I have the, a pair together right now. I don't know if they stuck, but we'll find out in a few months. <laughs> Ooh, hell, yeah. hell yeah. Dude, that's awesome. I uh I I think that that is is often overlooked for the terms of like intro venomous species because you know, if you have a 3 foot long hook, it's very infrequently that you would be within the strike range of a copperhead if you're doing things the yeah. appropriate way you know the, the the right way um you know using a three-foot hook not sticking your hand inside of the enclosure using your hook to open up the doors using your hook to close the doors it's very easy to stick to your protocol and keep yourself a very safe distance away from a copperhead as opposed to almost any of the other species of venomous snakes <laughs> right, that people right. get as their first <laughs> venomous snake, you know, a, oh, yeah. uh, a monocle cobra, a, gaboo, a uh, Western yeah. diamondback rattlesnake, like any of those, yeah. at some point it is going to get big enough where a three foot hook, you're still within the strike range at some point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and a wow. huge perk to the copperhead too, aside from it being a more mild venom, it is still potentially lethal to people. But yes. uh, aside from that, uh, it's a, a North American native and the antivenin anti that we use yeah. on that species is a polyvalent, which polyvalent. means it has multiple species used for that one antidote. And it's found throughout North America in thousands of hospitals. So yeah. if that is a consideration, which it should be, uh, that aids in the education of that animal it aids in the ability to keep that animal because you have somewhat of a reassurance that you will get treatment and, not die that you will safe it in a True. or keep it in a safe manner because right. it's one thing to keep things but also to do so in a safe manner that mitigates the amount of you dying if something goes wrong yes yes, <laughs> yes. yeah and, I and I, as much as overlooked oh very much so and in terms of like an easy to keep species they are very forgiving because we we're talking about being desert and blah 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 but they usually don't ride a hook in the beginning. So it kind of gives you a workout, if you will, in terms of maintaining the animal on two sticks, for lack of a better word. And then as you interact with that animal more, they tend to, to, to become more tolerant and ride a hook really well. So as you're learning how to manipulate the animal with snake hooks, it's learning to be a cooperative specimen at the same time. So I, I like that <laughs> about them. Yeah. Yeah, man. I, I, I wish that more people considered them. I think that, a lot of people, when it comes to venomous, at least some of the people, they don't look at it as like lovingly or like with as much like admiration as they do a cobra or a right, right. gaboon viper or you know any of the other species that people are free, you know after the the squams. People don't look at copperheads the same way when in reality it's probably a much better intro than any of those other species or, or even all of those species combined. I think that, you know, getting that foot in the door with those sets you up for at least, you know, some basis of, of knowledge and, and skill when it comes to extrapolating onto other species. Yes, absolutely. And I'm all for getting babies and raising them up. That's like my MO and people have kind of, ridiculed me in a, in a jovial manner of like oh man you still haven't bred those it's been five years and i'm like yeah man slow game right slow game mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but talk about an animal that doesn't necessarily go through a full onto the onto genetic change where the baby looks totally different than the adult but you get the the neon green tail when they're Damn. babies you yeah, get the yeah, cross yeah. bands when they're babies as they get older they kind of fade and the pattern kind of separates i mean this is one of the trans pecos that i i had to take a picture because it, it's on the white the i don't keep them on paper towels but for cleaning i just kind of held them there but dude the contrast it's like oh, oh yeah. yeah dude crazy contrast Oh. Damn. oh, 
That thing's like, silly, man. It's like my pants just Oogety. got tighter. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. It's almost Oogety red. I love it. Dude, that is phenomenal. Did, did someone just eggs. hear? Did someone just hear a spring go doing? <laughs> Sorry, that was. I got the upgrade, and that's what it does, man. Also, nice, nice. Ah. <laughs> uh, I'd make a Wayne's World joke, but I know that most of the listeners probably most don't know who that is. Know. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Uh, so, are there any species that you're like uh, wanting to branch out and, and get now, or, or anything that's on your your list for uh, that you've you've moved recently? You're kind of setting up your room, kind of how you you want yeah. it, getting adjusted to the move, and how your room ebbs and flows. But is there any uh, species that you're looking to add to? The the problem is the I definitely want to get more subox, more transpecos rat snakes. That's definitely on my radar. Um, just because I'm having so much fun with them, man. And they're just they're such great animals. They're they're derpy looking, they're good eaters, they're personable, they're super friendly. Um, but in terms of the venomous stuff, it <laughs> Eric was more than <laughs> love you, brother. Um uh as far as the venomous stuff, the stuff I want is really expensive now. Yeah. So I'm going to kind of wait and see. And if some stuff falls in my lap or I get an opportunity or a window, if you will, then I might climb through that window on some of that stuff. But honestly, the next venture, and this is so left field for me because I'm such a snake guy, but uh, Billy Hunt and I have been going pretty hardcore on toads. And uh, I have an old gecko rack that I've slowly been upgrading the geckos out of. And I'm going to mm-hmm. gut that rack and I'm going to, I want to do some locality specific Southern toads, man, dude. I want to yeah, get some, some Carolina reds. If I can, I want to get some panhandle blues. I want to get some dude. my local, my local funky, almost granite looking ones from Palm beach County, Florida. And, and just get like one of these, two of those and, and try my hand at some amphibians. I've always been apprehensive of it because of the water purity and humidity and blah, blah, blah. And I said, you know what? I, I've been keeping a small group of, um, uh Bufotes bullingeri the um uh, egyptian green toads they're mm. desert species of toad so i'm like all right they can handle the heat but so can florida southern toads so yep. as long as i have the humidity in their tub enclosures they should be fine in the desert room so that's gonna probably be the next venture to be honest <laughs> which is dude, so left field yeah, you know no that's awesome i i remember when i moved down here I, I was just like hiking different areas and different parks and stuff. And I started seeing these toads that are like bright flaming red. And I'm yeah, like, dude, what the hell is that? Yeah. <laughs> dude, I've never seen a toad that red before. And it's yeah. not like they're uncommon. They're just like all over the freaking place. Yeah, man. Do those Carolina reds. They get me every time, man. Gorgeous. They're so freaking cool. Gorgeous toads. The and Carolina uh, just... be producing some red herbs, you know? Yeah pygmies and toads i love it the uh i just did a trip with the npr boys to north florida and uh you know we kind of we kind of venture off in little little groups as we're herping and uh nipper and i this is his first time herping the east coast of the united states he's from oh, london heck yeah and uh dude we we got all six native species of florida toad in a week dude, and uh, i think i feel like that really set us set me into like the toadastic world of amphibians. <laughs> uh, it's, it's totally actually, incredible. It's Somebody totally clipped that. Cool. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's actually it's my fiance's slang. Every time I'm like, "Babe, look at this toad." She goes, "It's toadastic. It's totally awesome." <laughs> uh, yes. So yeah, that's uh, and it's good, man. And to, and to see a uh, a tall, skinny British guy trying to catch a cane toad in the in the cane fields of South Florida, him running around the car trying to catch it, priceless. <laughs> Because I know he's going to listen to this later. So, <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Yeah. You know, it's it's one thing to get like a little piece of it, but getting the totality of it is oh, a lot better, you know? Damn. Oh, man. So, yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Dude. I am all about that. That's awesome. I'm going to have to send yeah. you some toad pictures because I, I've seen some really cool toads here in, in North Carolina since I've been down here. Yeah, but man. I always just like catch them. I'm like, oh, hey, look at you. And then I put them down and I just like keep going. I'm like, hey, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And dude, uh, you guys get oak toads up by you, right? I believe so, yeah. There's yeah. Some, I'm pretty sure. I don't know how high up it goes, but there's a, I don't know if it's like 
coastal South Carolina, but there's a oak toad where the stripe is red Ooh. instead of white. And like, I want to see that. That just yeah. sounds cool. So. That does sound really cool. Yeah. I think the ones that I've got around me are, are the white striped ones. Yeah, if, I'm, white if it's the toad that I'm thinking of, because there's there's a species that, that comes by here that has a, a really, you know, decently colored stripe that goes from the eye back down. Yeah. But now, this I'm is the one that goes well right down the, the vertebral stripe of the back. Okay. They're super tiny, though, like this big. Maybe not the same species that I'm thinking of. But yeah, man, there's I have to a, do some research. I'm not as well versed on the frogs and toads I know, and as, as I as I. Uh, and I feel like stuff. that's the fun of it is because I've been so obsessed with snakes and and a handful of lizards over the years that this is like the new knowledge part. You know, like this mm-hmm. is yeah, yeah, know, yeah, we're, yeah. We're always thirsty for more herpetological knowledge, and I don't know anything about amphibians, so this is like a, the whole new venture for me. So, aside from a handful of snake species and some geckos that I'm going to hopefully get in the in the distant future i just i get to buy more books yeah i get to i get to buy more frog and toad books like who's better than that <laughs> right? so hell yeah that is awesome yeah it, it it definitely helps when you go to expo and you're like i don't really have more time to spend on more animals but i can do some reading at the end of my night on a new book <laughs> Oh wait, I thought you were talking about buying books at the expo. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah, if you go to the expo, you're like, I don't really have more time to buy a new animal. So instead of buying the animal, I'm going to buy new books, and then you know, yeah. in my spare time, while I'm winding down for the night, instead of cleaning, yes. I can be reading books about different exactly. species. Exactly. Right. And then you end up getting new species, and then yeah, right. <laughs> that's how it rolls. It's a cycle. It's a cycle. It's, it's a like cycle. a circle. It's a v- vicious cycle. <laughs> Truly vicious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, Dude, we gotta go herping. I gotta get down there. It's gotta uh, happen. Yes. I was talking about Jeremy, or me and Jeremy have been talking again recently. Is like we need to do another one of those Florida trips where we do a little like a day or two down in South Florida and then hit Central Florida and then hit northern Florida and and, and span it out over, I don't know, a week or something, you know, five days yeah. where we just get yeah. out there and do some herping because I'm fiending. I need to get out and herp more. Like, don't get me wrong. <laughs> I really enjoy herping here, but seeing wild cotton mouths and all these different water snakes and all these different, you know, seeing alligators and all that stuff, I, I need it in my life in, a, in the worst kind of way. And see, uh, you're killing me because I love Ambistoma. I've never seen one of those in the wild, and you're just coming up left and right with them Ooh. suckers. Well, Dude. bro, you come up here in February, March, or in like October, November, and I will show you like 30 marbled salamanders in a day. And there's another place where I we the last time we went out and we saw 12 spotted salamanders in one wow. day. Wow, wow, yeah. freaking that's yeah. awesome. It's getting Love close it. to the temperature now where they're going to start going back underground. But uh, yeah, spring and fall, you come out of here, I'll show you some freaking salamanders, man. Because the last, <laughs> when we found those spotted salamanders, we were losing our mind because me and Kristen are out there and we're rolling logs. We're like, oh, there's spotted. And we pick, take it out and take a million pictures of it. And then we're like, okay, 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 man, that was awesome. And then we're walking around, oh, let's check on that logo. Oh, another spotted. Oh my God, it's so great. And then we're like shaking each other and like so excited. And, you know, it went in Massachusetts, like, there are spotted salamanders up there, but I'd seen like, you know, maybe a dozen of them over my life, uh, you know, seeing them, and, you know, one here and one there. And like, just the mindset of when you want to see salamanders is not when snakes are out. And yeah. so I'm like, Oh, it's like 50 degrees and it's raining outside. I really don't want to be outside right now, but the salamanders are like, salamanders <laughs> <too>. <laughs> they're, all, they're all hyped. That night that we went road cruising for for salamanders, I think we saw like ten uh, spotted salamanders just cruising that night, and it was just like you know it's steadily raining, and we're out there, we're like we're getting wet, but we're seeing lots of salamanders, so it's worth it. Yeah, man, grab your poncho and your your gloves and your galoshes, and who's better than you? We were ill prepared. We were out there in sweatshirts <laughs> and jeans that so we were getting rained on, but. The salamanders were worth it, so it was, yeah, it was, it was okay. We got to get you guys down here, and we'll, we'll hit some of the WMAs and find you some sirens. Dude, oh, I would love to see some badass. of those. 
That would be badass. Dude. Yeah, man. A little bit scary, but that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I heard they bite really hard. Well, no, no. You're talking about Infuma. Yes, yes, Infuma. Yeah, Infuma, Sorry. Yeah, Infuma get way bigger than the Infuma, they'll take your toe off, but no. Yeah. Sirens are they're they're singing songs, man. They're 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 elegant. Love them. They're calling me to South Florida. That's it, man. <laughs> That is it. Yeah, it. we definitely do, do need to plan that trip, bro. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think that this this weekend, I'm, I think it's going to be this weekend. Yeah, it's probably going to be this weekend that I'm going to be going down to Black Box. So I'm going to be making the trip down to Georgia. And then uh, last weekend, I was down in South Carolina. So I had eight hours in the car last Saturday. And then I'm about to do another 10 hours in the car this weekend uh, from, from Georgia and back. But so maybe not the following weekend, but maybe a couple weekends after that, we can figure something yeah, out. That's yeah. fair, dude. Yeah, no rush. Yeah, no rush. Remember, it just only, has to happen, but no rush. Yes. The <laughs> only time you can't herp in Florida, excuse me, is around Daytona. Yeah, well, obviously that. But no, <laughs> the only time the only time you can't herp South Florida, where I'm at, you know, south of Big O, is January, February. Other than that, yep. the whole year you'll find stuff. Oh hell yeah. Yeah, I, I, Daytona is going to happen this year, so I'm, I'm definitely going to be doing some early morning herping again because seeing those pygmies, man, before before we left was it was really it, freaking nice. Is it bad that I'm really excited that I'll finally be able to go to a show and not have to answer all the "Where's Rob?" questions? Yes, <laughs> yes. <clears throat> <laughs> bruh, plaguing bruh. me for the last couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, I should man. be at this. I'll, I'll be at this Daytona, and then yeah. I, I would like to make Tinley happen. But alternatively, I would much prefer to go to Southeast Arizona for Sky Island rattlesnake. Yeah. So Hell I think yeah. that the rattlesnakes are going to win out this year, unless I can pull something off and win the lottery or something but uh, dude sky that... islands will change you man oh it's a, i have it's a feeling a, it's a biblical thing bro it's awesome mm -hmm. hell yeah mm -hmm. absolutely awesome mm -hmm. it, it touches your soul man like just like top of the islands to bottom like the lowlands and the prairie and just the open desert man and it uh, it's unlike anything you've ever seen so definitely mm -hmm. go yeah, I I need to see Melosis in the worst kind of way, and then oh, yeah. Willard Eye and Lepidus are like, you know, some clubs are are very very high on my list. I think Willard Eye are like my holy grail for American species, like U.S. species. So yeah, man, uh, it's got to happen. It's just it, dude, I've been find... putting it off for too long. When you find a Willie man, it'll change you. It re it really I... will. Mm -hmm. It's 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 like a um. It's a spiritual thing, man. Yeah. You know, and and you can't you can't pick it up, you can't move it, you can't touch it. It's all protected. But just to be there and like just to hear that tiny little rattle and just be in its presence and know that you're at the top of a mountain that hasn't changed for millennia, and it's just above the world, man. With this tiny little rattlesnake, it, it's it's it, dude, it's spiritual, man. I hate to I get choked up, man. It's crazy. If you go to uh, venomexchangeradio.com, the banner of our website some selfless plug then exchange radio.com if you go to the banner of it it's the willard eye that that me and the npr boys got so yeah man. super cool thanks that's like I, I already know i can feel it like i'm gonna get choked up when i when I oh see for, it. Sure. <laughs> for sure yeah absolutely man it's just such a such a cool species mm. 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 <laughs> <laughs> gotta happen it's like what we were talking about before the show with like the beam of light you know yes <laughs> yes yeah the skies have opened you know exactly yeah exactly. that's it that's it oh i love it those yeah. stupid little rattlesnakes <laughs> uh, mm. Mm -mm. Oh, man. i need awesome. them in my life <laughs> That's why I know I'm just going to get like a million messages from Rob is just going to like, I'm not going to be able to understand a single word. Yeah. Oh, just coming out of his mouth. Well, <laughs> the best part is you're going to get spammed all these messages at like four in the morning because right. he'll, he'll send them at, you know, six o'clock at night when they found it. 
but he's on the top of the mountain. So it's going right. to take that no long Wi-Fi. And, right. and you're three hours behind. So you're going to get him at four in the morning going, what the hell? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Basically what's going to happen. Yes. Yep. yes. yep. Mm-hmm. I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. Yeah. That's it, man. It'll be worth it. <laughs> A thousand percent. Well, you just got to, Jeremy, you got to go with him, man. I mean, I'm down, but I, yeah. uh, if it's, if it's Tinley time, I can't do it. Cause I have to, I have to work uh, at Tinley. I, yeah. But. So then you, you make it, you know, a couple days so, after a couple yeah, days if it's before. not Tinley time. I'm, yeah. I'm down. I'm, I'm down. Yeah. And like, especially <laughs> like you two as co-host, man, like it's a bonding moment. Oh, it'll be great. Hell yeah, dude. dude. I mean, I'm fucking down. I mean, you don't, have, <laughs> you don't have to say much to convince yeah, twist me. my it's arm. Like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. we're going to go here for reptiles. Uh, I just, I don't know, man. Jeremy, like, I'm just letting you know now. I'm only gonna sleep for two hours a night. Uh, that's 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 just what it's gonna be. I'm gonna yeah, be road cruising and fucking. That's gonna be uh, what makes me say no. no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah well, dude, that's, like, that's the me way. And Rob do, Stone got to get out there, man. Because I, I hear the stories about Rob Stone, and I'm like, oh, me and him would get along on a fucking herping trip because for sure. I don't eat, man. I'm just like so focused. I'm like, oh shit, it's already been eight hours. I didn't even realize I, I was too busy looking for rattlesnakes well let's let's yep. uh maybe well, let's like, stop and get a quesadilla real quick and then let's get back yeah. on the trail that's it man that's a thousand percent where's the nearest taco truck and that that's the <laughs> thing is we told rob look man we love you but if you're hungry that means we're starving so yeah it's probably, <laughs> you should probably start heading right. back you know yeah yeah yeah, by sure. the time by the time Rob realizes he's hungry, I've stopped on six different rocks and sat down and had something to eat. <laughs> yes. yeah. yeah, man. The dude's got a metabolism like a hummingbird. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I so. literally have an alarm set on my watch at 1 p.m. every day to remind myself, hey, you gotta stop and eat because otherwise I just don't. I just like forget completely. And yeah, I'll be like going through my work day and I'm like, oh, it's five o'clock. What have I eaten today? uh let's see i had a bottle of water a bottle of dr pepper and that is it i have not eaten anything today i need to go find some food right quick yeah bro yep that's it <laughs> that's herping baby <laughs> good stuff i feel like yeah. that's how it's gonna be so 100 percent. oh shit <laughs> Okay, well, we've we've run a little bit past our time, but thank you so much for being on, Phil. We do have one question that we ask every guest at the end of our episodes, and that question is, what in the realm of reptiles, be it something that you're personally working on or something that you've seen on the internet that somebody else is doing or something that's scientific that's been discovered recently, what has you excited about reptiles right now? Our ability to share data in our husbandry mm-hmm. the fact mm-hmm. that everyone's got a go v everyone's on the wi-fi as i say on the line right and the fact that i can look at a weather station in luxor egypt and i can get an idea of what's happening at that exact moment in time i can set my thermostat in my enclosures to vary the amount of uv that luxor egypt is getting right now I can cool things down, I can heat things up, and I can share all this data with everyone else in my community. That to me is fascinating. And I love where we're going with the full spectrum lighting and the different bulbs and LEDs and ventilation. And I feel like our husbandry is, it's not at its peak. Oh, but it's its climbing real steep, real fast. And I absolutely love that. I love where companies like Black Box, like forget the sponsorship, man. It's an awesome company with awesome enclosures. Perfect. Right. And they're, they're catering to what what we as keepers are telling them. Hey, we want this much substrate dam. I told them, I was like, look, I want your exact cage, but I want sliders with a venomous lock that doesn't have a stick on nonsense ratchet thing yeah. that's going to break yeah, in, yeah, yeah. in a month. And they did it. They did pin locks for me. Like the, the fact that we have the ability to communicate our husbandry findings as well as our field research findings to accentuate and augment our keeping and our, our sharing of these amazing animals, that to me is is fantastic right now in, in our day of age, in our era, if you will. Yes. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. I'm That's, that. Hell yeah. 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 That, that, that to me, the, the communication of what we're doing is is awesome. Yeah. And I think that that's one of the important reasons why having a podcast like ours, a podcast like NPR, a podcast like 
Venomous Exchange Radio and the Prophetic Culture Network to archive and save that information yeah. for people in the future um, to learn from and to grow their knowledge and to expand their um, you know field of view so that people can learn from our mistakes and from the things that we've learned and build upon that to expand and grow i think that that is like super important i think that's really cool one of the things i always i i feel like i m- maybe bothered them but uh owen and and eric i when they have a herp history show i message him afterwards i'm like thank you so much for having <laughs> this person on i learned so much i need to go back and listen to it again and like uh we just this just happened the other day richard gross uh yeah. you know, the blue bible yeah, just passed yeah. away and uh, he was on there. And now that that information is preserved and I know that they probably wish that they could have had more conversation with him and, and was able to, to preserve more of that, but just even just having that ability to have had him on in the past to preserve some of that information uh, because, you know, all these people have so many stories of where they've been and the things that they've learned in their travels and, and they're keeping, you know, we could never, bring all of that down and and save all of that but in doing episodes like herp history and and like the stuff you're doing with venice exchange radio yeah, it man. preserves pieces of that for people in the future that they can learn from i think that's Absolutely. super important well said man well said and don't feel bad about bothering them with their with the questions on herp history because those two guys not only are they com- so Eric and Rob specifically have been communicating with their herper keeper friends in Australia, but also with plant people because the Aussie animals they're keeping, they're filling the enclosure with native Aussie plants and trying oh, to get cool. the soil right. And I hope I didn't let some kind of cat mm. out of the bag by saying, that, but, like, <laughs> but like just going back to the communication, like everything from having Ross on a show to, and like not just talking about the blue Bible, but all of those experiences and the ability to share those experiences and share the knowledge so that we can all be better keepers. We can all take better care of our animals and we can all help the animals both in the home and in the wild. And it, I'm with you, man. I love it. Yeah. Hell yeah. It's just little tiny steps moving forward and yeah. we don't feel like they're big steps until we look back at how far we've come and we're looking at, radiant heat panels and uv lighting inside of enclosures Dude, I, I had a heat rod bioactive yep oh i, I used I had a heat rocks rod. for a really long time man and yeah. there was ways i actually found to modify the heat rocks so that they were more effective for me and so and less of a risk but i still used them you know yeah. and uh coming from that to where i'm at right now where i'm you know stacking up scrub cages next to me currently yeah, you know um, yeah. And and reproducing these snakes that I dreamed about keeping ten years ago. Which, by the uh, way, you get all the golf claps in the world, my friend, because you are killing <laughs> it, bro, killing it. I am trying. Uh, I I still don't feel that I am. You know, I've got the craziest imposter syndrome when it comes to that sort of thing because I uh, I I feel like I should be more accomplished at at this point in my life, you know, but. It, it is what it is. And, and I, I do appreciate the things that I've done so far. And if I die today, just know that I lived a pretty fun life and I, I did some fun stuff. So I, dude, I don't. Every yeah. Somalia win that you have is a Somalia win for all of us. Yes. That's it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And me and Stephen Kush are talking all the freaking time, throwing ideas back and forth at each other and fucking trying to figure out like what, what what we're doing here, what what little things that I'm seeing, what little things that he's seeing, and how they're different and how certain things are the same. And you know, that that is one of the things that he brings up and talks about a lot. It's like the old guard, people like guarding information and keeping it away from people, and they learn something and they have a win and they don't want anyone else to have it. And me and him are both of the mindset of fuck that man what the fuck are you doing come on if more people are successful everybody wins there is not a situation where if i'm not successful breeding scrubs it makes it better for him breeding scrubs it's just not real it's fake it's made up it's based on ego and people thinking that they deserve to have something and nobody else should have it and that needs to be gone we do not need that in this hobby 
everybody should be able to enjoy this hobby. I don't think that we should be in any sort of position to be shutting people out of this. Agreed. And in an, in an era where I can share information with people from Australia, from West Papua, from Africa, from South America, in an instant, I can be talking to people from all of those continents at the same exact time. We shouldn't be gatekeeping information and we should yeah. be working together to, to make things better. You know, I'm with you a thousand percent, man. Hell yeah, dude. Phil, <laughs> I love you. I appreciate you. Thank love you so you much too, for coming Thank on this so evening, much, man. Yeah, man. I can't wait to see you at Daytona. I'm going to give you a yes. giant hug. For sure. For Maybe both of you. I want, I want both yeah. at the same time. Yes. <laughs> Neither shoulder. That's it. I'm there. I'm just going to like lay my head on. I'm shorter than both of you, so it'll, it'll be comfortable. <laughs> we, we got a picture where we're like holding you like uh, he's gonna be under one leg i'll be underneath the other one and we're both holding you up i'm, I'm hefty we might have to have a couple of the guys to help <laughs> let's do it let's get smitty in there come on buddy yeah yeah yeah. i'm game i'm down i love oh, it oh man i love it. so if people yeah. want to follow you and see the things that you're working with and the things that you're doing you've got like 47 things that you've got a list right now so you better eat. just oh, just get started right, explaining right. to people so, <laughs> easiest way to get a hold of me is on instagram it's knobtails.ig um that's where we post but where i post the snakes and stogie stuff as well as the herbert culture network on instagram and facebook uh and then venom exchange radio uh venom exchange radio.com venom exchange radio on all the podcast platforms as well as the herbert culture network on all the podcast platforms and venom exchange radio on youtube there's not much but we're working on it so that's it. And you've Hell got yeah. venomous, safe venomous handling courses or like videos on there. Yeah, well. I started to uh, I started to do what we called venomous etiquette videos, which I'm going to work more on. It's tough. Uh, while I was making the first couple of videos, we learned that nobody wants to watch a 40 minute video on safe handling. They want 15 seconds of some guy almost losing his life. Almost getting so, bit. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm probably going to chop up some of the stuff I have, make it a little shorter, make it a little more friendly, and then. Try and put some tips out there and some uh, my opinion as advice and try and steer some people in the right direction and then just try and get some more knowledge out there. So that's the goal. Oh, yeah, then yeah I, was literally, I was literally thinking about that and I was like, when I start to get, uh, you know, when I move counties and I'm able to branch out into Venomous, I would love to help you with it cultivating some content for yeah. that and, and safe handling and all that sort of stuff because i that's one of the things that i'm very passionate about is safe handling of venomous snakes and there's lots of ways to have interesting conversations and and to work with venomous snakes and have it be interesting while still also being safe yeah. and i think that people who are riding the death you know trying to catch the bullet train to death uh they get the views but honestly they are doing everyone a disservice and when they're doing yeah things. and and the people that yeah the people that really want to learn the proper technique the proper safe handling protocol they're going to come to people like us and that makes yeah. me happy you know so the least yeah. we can yeah. do is 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 give them a tidbit of knowledge to to help them be safe and to help them have a better time a better experience for both themselves and the animal and that's the goal of it man and if and if two people watch if nobody watches it who cares at least we did it so yeah yeah and the the resource has to be there for people to be able to search for it because if people are searching and the only thing that they're finding is the nine finger gang then that's how they're going to think that it should be done and 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 ultimately uh you know there's other ways to do things that are safer and better for everybody. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Absolutely. Cool. Thank you so yeah, much for being man. on, man. Yeah, thank I love you so guys. much, man. This was a blast. I loved it. It was great. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. And yeah. we will catch you guys next time. Make sure you check out blackboxcages.com. Get yourself in a rack, get yourself an enclosure and we'll see you next time. See ya. Bye.